I had been sent to Korea from my university a few years ago. They told me for my major I had to go somewhere in Asia, and my friend had really talked up Korea for me. I knew nothing about it, but I decided, why not, and I embarked on a semester-long trip. I had only had one serious boyfriend in my life, who I had broken up with a few months prior. I also don't enjoy one-night stands and wasn't digging the dudes at the clubs in Seoul, but I still wanted to have some sort of romantic experience, I suppose, so my friend recommended I use this dating app to meet English-speaking Koreans. That way I could meet someone and experience the actual dating culture. I thought, I'm young, why not? I was just so eager to have some new experiences. Maybe it sounds dumb to try dating in a foreign country, but it worked out for me eventually. Just not the first date. I met him on a dating app after being in Seoul for about three weeks. Let's call him Tim. I still didn't know the culture or city very well and was a bit naive about everything. He eagerly wanted to meet for a date after talking to me, and he seemed nice. I should have asked more questions, and I should have noticed that he was not giving me any details about himself. Tim was a guy a bit older than me, but claimed he was a college student. I assumed he had done his military time, all men in Korea have to, and returned to school. We talked for a bit and decided to meet for a tea date near the school I went to. He wanted to come to my dorm originally to pick me up, but I live in an all-woman's dorm and I didn't want him to know exactly where I lived since we were all still strangers. So instead I insisted we meet at the main tower center near the subway. He really didn't like this idea which looking back was a red flag, but eventually I insisted. The night of the date I waited an hour for this guy. He was very late. Tim weirdly claimed he just wanted to make me wait. I thought he was kidding and messaged him a laughing emoji assuming he was just lost. When he finally arrived he was much smaller than I thought, but a man's height has never been something I care about much. He was also quite thin. Maybe I let my guard down because I didn't see him as physically threatening to me which was a mistake in the end. Right off the bat he was way too touchy with me and breathed creepy and heavy. I was so off put with his demeanor. I'm usually very tolerant with different personality types, but this was very odd to me. I had been told that Korean men would be polite and not so touchy on the first date. He was also dressed oddly, like in business attire for a date, and I thought that maybe it's just a Korean thing. Again, I was dumb and knew nothing about the culture. Then the first thing he said to me was, You're not as white as I thought you were. I thought this was a translation error, but his English was near perfect, so I asked for clarification and he said what he meant. I thought you'd be more white. Your skin is darker than I thought and your eyes aren't as green. Are you pure European? Now I was officially weirded out. First of all, I'm pretty much as white as you can get. I'm Irish and Scandinavian, so white as all possibly can be. So the fact that he thought I could possibly be any whiter was funny. And why did he care in the first place anyway? Why does my skin color matter to this guy and why is he bringing it up? He said about three times on the date how he wished I had greener eyes. And every time I would just reply, well, maybe my online photos make me look brighter. And brushed it off as him being nervous and trying to start a conversation. Isn't it funny the dumb excuses you make for people when you're panicked? When we arrived at the tea place, I tried to order a basic raspberry tea, and he stopped me and told me I had to have this special tea. I thought it was weird he wanted to choose my tea for me, but in my head I brushed it off once again. He really insisted I drink only this tea type, and I just agreed. These small details became weirder later. After tea, he asked me if we could look around my school. It was dark, but the school is very well lit, so I agreed. And the whole time we walked around, he would randomly stop and grab me for long hugs. At first I let it happen, but then I stopped him, and he just kept trying. He kept grabbing me and breathing hard in my neck. It was so incredibly awkward. He also would not tell me any personal details about himself. I asked so many questions, desperately trying to distract from all the awkward grabbing, and to try to get to know him, but he would never tell me anything. He even said at one point, I'm a mysterious man. 
like a movie line. He also said something like, You look so much like my favorite movie character. And I asked who, but he said that I would have to figure it out on my own. Finally he said, I want to go to a dark area. And in my head I screamed, no. At this point I wanted this date over fast. He somehow knew that there was a wooded area behind my campus and he said we should go there. I said no and that I wanted to stay near the main campus in town, but he kept pushing. Finally he grabbed my arm and started dragging me there. He said, I can't let anyone see. And I started to panic. I finally ripped my arm away and just demanded we leave and go back to the main road immediately. Looking back, I don't know why I didn't ask for help or get angry. Maybe I was scared, but I just began to book it back to the main road and he followed. We ended up in front of a hospital near the center of town and I told him it was time for him to go. I made some excuse and he was pleading with me to stay. I told him we could meet the next day, a lie, and that I would message him. I just wanted to get away at this point. I was pretending it was all okay, just so that he would leave. Suddenly, I think he's leaning in to kiss me, and I immediately think, oh god no, but it was so much worse. Instead, I feel pain on my face. It takes me a second to realize he was biting my face. It was like a dog. I had never felt the sensation before. He leaned his head sideways and bit me on my nose and cheek as hard as he could. I screamed and pushed him away from me. His face looked so freaky and I barely had time to react in words. Instead I ran up the sidewalk until I saw a convenience store on the right. I ran to the back of the store and bent down to start crying. The man who owned the store started to yell at me but I couldn't explain my situation. I just begged him in English to let me stay. I ended up having to buy a popsicle to stick around. God, I wish I had learned some Korean by then. I guess Tim didn't follow me. I peered outside the store and didn't see him. I texted a friend and waited for them to get me to take me back to my dorm. On the way I messaged Tim and basically told him to stay away from me. I told him he was a creep and that he shouldn't bite women and something along the lines of me calling the police and then I blocked him. I was so scared to walk around my school area after that, I was so afraid that he would find me somehow, and so thankful I never let him pick me up at my dorm. I called my mom to tell her about what happened when suddenly she said, wait, what did he ask you? She then put some details together and realized that all of these weird things had to do with the Fifty Shades of Grey books. At first, I thought she was just being silly and overthinking a bad date. I thought she was joking. But oh god, she was right. She had recently seen the movie or read the book or something and knew the details. The eye color and way he dressed, and the tea he made me drink and the random lines he said. It all matches the books and movies for his dirty little fantasy. My mom thinks he picked me up because I look like the girl in that movie to him. It explains why he was so fixated on my appearance and his whole thing with the biting and trying to dominate me. Even if it wasn't his intention, I later learned that there are some few creeps who seek out foreign girls to dominate and do what they will with them like a prize. They call it riding the white horse or something along those lines. On a happier note, this bad experience didn't stop me. I did eventually meet someone else in Korea and we ended up falling in love. We even did the whole long distance thing and now I'm living in Korea studying and working, hoping to marry soon. So I guess I didn't let bad creepy guys stop me from living my life. I grew up in the south. Tons and tons of beautiful places to see that haven't been taken over by concrete yet. It's nice. But along with that, it's pretty boring. Being a teenager and wanting to go out and have fun led to mostly improvising with your buddies and hoping something good will come out of the night. There wasn't really a local spot to go hang out like a club or cool bar and the places that were close to this were boring because you did them so many times. I'm sure if you've ever lived in a rural area you can understand that feeling completely. 
Something that I found a ton of enjoyment in as a teen was just cruising around super late at night listening to music. I would fill my gas tank up, grab something to drink, a cigarillo, and I would just take off driving around until the sun came up. It was a way for me to just clear my mind and relax. Those country back roads were always fun to drive down at 2am and was also just the right amount of spooky. Well, one night I absolutely got more than I was to bargain for. I can't remember what month it was exactly, but I know for a fact it was in the summertime because I was out of school and I also remember it being a comfortable chill night. So if I was to guess, it just had been around July or August. I was cruising around like I always did and was completely worry free. I had music blaring and I was in my zone. I decided to head down to a park just out of boredom. This particular park is at the very end of a long stretch of desolate country road, but it is a really pretty drive because of that. When I say desolate country road, I don't mean that it's some dirt road that goes through the woods or anything crazy like that. It is a normal paved road, but there is really nothing on it after a certain point. The entire road takes about 20 minutes to drive down to get to the park, and after about 10 minutes into the drive, the houses start to get spread out further and further to becoming no houses and just road leading into the park. I think a lot of the reason I liked this drive at night is because of how creepy it was, and I looked at it as some sort of adventure or whatever. The park isn't open for camping or anything. It's mostly just a lot of land with walking trails and biking trails set up through miles of woods, so obviously at around 3am in the morning it's pretty dead. I made it there and just did a slow, normal little loop around drive of the park. The night before it stormed very badly. So badly I remember my parents and I had to take shelter because of the threat of a tornado touchdown. There ended up being no tornado but the storms were pretty rough. Because of this, I came up on a fallen tree in the road that looped around to the exit of the park that must have happened because of the storm. It wasn't some massive tree or anything but I know for a fact that there was no way I could have gotten over it in my car obviously. It was pitch black everywhere besides the front of my car because of my headlights and because of that I immediately rolled out backing up the entire way I drove when I entered the park. I knew that was super dangerous and there was no way. At this spot on the road there was flat land on each side of me. I figured that it would make the most sense to just back up into the grass beside me just a little then drive back the way I came. It was a one way loop around the park but I wasn't really worried about going out the wrong way since it was so late. So I started to back up off of the road so I could get my car turned around. All was good until I went to pull back up on the road. I totally didn't take into account how wet the grass was and the amount of mud. My car went absolutely nowhere. My back tires were completely stuck and were spinning in place as I was trying to floor the gas pedal. I started to become pretty scared at this point. Not the most ideal situation to be in. I immediately take my cell phone out of my pocket and saw that I had service. Super huge feeling of relief. I called my parents and told them what happened and where I was. They were pretty angry at me but said that they will pay for a tow truck to come get me out. My parents both drove small four-door sedans and they would have been zero help in that situation. I was about 45 minutes away from my house and the rest of most human civilization, so I realized that I would be stuck out there for at least an hour before someone was able to get to me. Freaky feeling, but I tried getting out of my head and just continued to listen to music and be on my phone in the car while I waited. Not really much more I could do. After I kind of calmed down from the initial anger I had, I started to check out my surroundings. I didn't even notice at first because of everything going on, but in front of my car's placement was a field that was full of the most amount of deer I think I've ever seen at once. There legitimately must have been about 40 deer in this field just walking around and eating the grass. The field wasn't directly in front of my car, but if I was to get out and throw a rock in that direction, I would have easily been able to hit one of them. So if I was to guess, they were about 30 yards out. This didn't really help with the creepy level going on. Looking out in front of your car and seeing 80 eye reflections staring back at you is a bit of an alarming feeling overall, but I was relieved it was just a field of deer. I watched them for a little bit, but I was quickly over it and started to just browse through my social media apps while waiting. 
They seemed to have been over it quicker than I was because they all went back to walking around and eating once they figured out I wasn't going to attack them or anything. After browsing my phone for about 15 minutes, I finally get a call back from my parents letting me know that a tow truck guy is on the way and about an hour and a half out from my location. Still to this day I remember hearing that and having the thought, you've got to be kidding me. I understand that me and only me was the reason I was in that situation I was in so I couldn't really be mad at anyone else, but that was very obviously not what I wanted to hear. I decided that the smartest thing for me to do was just to make sure my doors were all locked, lay back in my seat and take a nap to pass time quick. So that's what I did. So I wake up 45 minutes later to the feeling of being watched. I'm not sure if anyone has ever experienced that feeling before because I don't know how common it is, but there was a sixth sense alarm going off in my head telling me that I needed to wake up. Waking up to that feeling in the situation I was in and the surrounding I was in is probably worst case scenario. I sit up and immediately check my surroundings and see nothing. I look through my car very quickly for any sort of weapon and found a pocket knife. A pocket knife. I was very scared. Even though I saw and heard absolutely nothing, that feeling is terrifying. I was shocked to see that the field of deer in front of me was still full of deer. I don't know anything about the animal, but I guess I always just assume they don't hang out in the same place for long. Not sure why I thought that, but I was surprised to see them nonetheless. I called my parents back to see if they heard any kind of update from the tow truck dude. I decided not to mention the feeling I was having because I didn't want them to worry more and I also knew that it was literally nothing more than a feeling I had and I had nothing to back up why I was feeling that way other than just being spooked out in general. No update from the tow truck guy so we all assumed everything was still the same on his end. The call lasted just a few minutes before I felt like such an idiot. They both had to wake up for work in a few hours and now they had to spend a random hundred plus dollars and on top of all of that, they were worried about me. I could tell that they were annoyed at the situation, but worried. I told them I'll make sure to tell them when the guy arrives and that I'm sorry. We hung up, and I looked up from the phone and immediately went from zero to a hundred in panic mode. The deer in front of me were all completely perked up staring in the same direction right of them. Let me remind you that there are around 40 deer in the field. Every single one of them were stopped dead in their tracks, standing completely still, looking at something. I put my high beams on and stared, waiting for absolutely anything to happen at all. Nothing. I tapped my horn real quick. They didn't even budge or look away. They were all still completely glued to what was by them. The way the tree line was, I couldn't see that far over in the field. I know that they were looking into the woods by them, but where I was, I was only able to see them. I could hear my heartbeat. I grabbed that stupid pocket knife and just waited for something to happen. I would say it was about a minute after I honked, every single one of them in unison started to run the opposite way. They were running at full speed and within 20 seconds the field was completely empty. I was petrified in fear. I knew that staying in my car is what would be the safest thing to do but it's the worst feeling in the world when you feel like a sitting duck. My head was on a swivel. I was freaking out in every way possible. I assumed it was a bear or something, but it could have been absolutely anything. I was convinced at that point it was the devil himself. I didn't know what to do. I knew that the tow truck was close by, but I had no idea where he was. I began to shake because of nerves and just looked around to make sure nothing was by me and focusing on the field in front of me. I did this for what felt like an actual eternity, sitting in complete silence and darkness in the middle of nowhere, waiting for something to jump out and attack you. Fifteen of the longest minutes of my life go by, and I start to see lights break through the tree line on the road. As it gets closer, I see it as the tow truck guy. The lights on his truck felt like it was Jesus coming from heaven to rescue me. He gets up to me and I jump out of my car and immediately ask him if he has a gun on him. I told him very quickly what just happened to me and that something is definitely out here nearby. He let me know that he had a shotgun in the truck and assured me that it was most likely a bear or bobcat. He gave me the whole, they're more scared of you than you are of them, etc, etc. 
The tree was small enough for him to sort of bulldoze it out of the way with his truck, and then he attached my car to his and pulled me out of the spot I was stuck in. He was very nonchalant about what I just experienced, but I was pretty badly shaken up from it. The whole time he was doing his thing, I still had my eyes glued out in that field waiting for something. He was completely done with everything in about 15 minutes, and he told me to follow his truck out of there onto the main road again. I got in my car and was ready more than anything to get out of this park. We started to drive away from the spot I was in and I still had my head on a swivel, completely shook up. As we were driving away, I looked at my rearview mirror. We were down the park road just a tiny bit, but I could still see the spot I was stuck in partially lit up from the vehicle lights and the moon. I watched in my rearview mirror a man come out of the tree line behind where my car was and walk into the middle of the road and watched us drive away. My heart stopped beating, legitimately. I lost my breath and my eyes started to get full of tears because of how absolutely scared I was in that moment. I couldn't see any sort of details like what he looked like or even necessarily what he was wearing, and to be honest I didn't really care. The feeling that I felt driving away from that spot knowing he was right there the whole time watching me. Watching me as I was freaking out looking around. Watching me as I was completely alone for a long time. Maybe even coming right up to my window and watch me as I sleep. That's a feeling that is something I can't necessarily put into words. All these years later and it still messes with me quite a bit. The entire time we were driving off, as long as I could see him, he didn't move. He just watched us in the road. A million things went through my mind. I was scared there may have been multiple people up the road waiting for us. I was trying to figure out if I should start beating on my horn like crazy to get the tow truck guy to stop or not. I decided that all I wanted to do was get out of there, more than anything. The second that we finally got out of the park and was able to be on a two-lane road again, I flew past the tow truck driver and I did nothing below 70 miles per hour the entire way home. I flew through stop signs and stoplights. I absolutely didn't care. The only thing on my mind was making it home. I got home, ran inside, very quickly acknowledged my parents and said sorry and thank you and went to my room. I didn't get a single second of sleep the rest of the night. I was searching for any sort of records of things happening in that area, escaped convicts, similar stories, etc., I came to the conclusion that the man was some sort of squatter or homeless. I read many things online of how it's common for homeless in rural areas to build shelters in the woods, which does make sense to me entirely on why they would do that. But obviously, the unknown is the scariest part of all. What if he wasn't homeless? What if he was going to hurt me? What if, what if, what if? There's so many possibilities of what could have happened, but... The outcome that did happen is what I am most grateful for. I never told my parents this story until many years after it happened and I was already an adult and moved out. It freaked them out too when I told them. I never went back to that park. Ever. Even though I no longer live by there, I still have no desire at all to ever go back there. I don't think I could even in broad daylight with a ton of people around. I also made the decision to stop doing those late night cruises. I did a few after that time with people, but even then I felt very uncomfortable and on edge. When I was about 13, I used to have my bed right under my bedroom window. It was also around the time my dog was brought inside because she got too old to stay out. At the time, we didn't have the screen coverings we have now, so the window could easily be opened and there was no barrier. I always left my windows open during the day to let in fresh air, then close and lock it when it started getting dark. My house is surrounded by forest. Not very thick, but still thick enough that you can't see clearly through it. It's completely normal hearing strange noises at night because things like bears or stray dogs or even our former neighbor's chickens that would roam around our yard. So when I heard something shuffling around my window, I didn't think about it and continued playing video games. Not even ten minutes later, I heard something hit against it. I thought it may have been a June bug. 
When they hit a window, they can sound like rocks, so I ignored it. The knocking kept going, but I just kept ignoring it, and finally it stopped. Fast forward until around 2 a.m. I was finally settling down and going to sleep when I hear breathing. Very faint. Enough to miss if the room wasn't silent. I heard something drag down my window, like a stick or a finger. It did it a few times, and that was enough for me. I jumped out of bed and ran into my dad's room. I told him that there was something at my window and he immediately came to look. We turned out the lights so he could see better but there was nothing. I told him what I heard and he said that he would take a look in the morning. We did just that and my stomach churned. Under my window there were two different foot tracks, one back and forth beside the generator and one that was back and forth directly under my window. There was even cigarette butts laying around near some bushes, like he had crouched there and waited. The foot tracks led toward the woods. We have neighbors that live through the woods and down the hill, and are very trashy, so we chalked it up to one of them coming here while drinking one night. Though what scared me the most about this was the fact that when I went to open my window later that day, I found that it was unlocked. I forgot to lock it the night before. He could have gotten in without issue. For some background, I am an early 20s female who have had a pretty rough childhood and due to some bad decisions found myself homeless in 2017. My aunt lived in a completely different state and I had only met her a handful of times but she's getting older and said she could use some help around the house and honestly I think she's just a bit lonely. She doesn't have any kids and she's at that age where a lot of her friends have either passed away or are really sick. Fast forward to September 6th of this year. My aunt is about to go on vacation with her three sisters and a sister-in-law. She's set to leave on the 8th and the only thing she's nervous about is this will be the first time I've been home alone since I started living with her. She's going to be gone for an entire week and it's not that she doesn't trust me, it's just that I haven't had the best of luck with people in my life. My mom used to pick on me that I always attract the crazy ones. My aunt is very well known in this community and especially with her neighbors who all love her and I've become really good friends with too. So every morning I wake up between 6 to 7 and take my dog out on a run so we usually get back around 8.30 right when my aunt is waking up get my dog breakfast, go shower, etc. This particular morning, I really wasn't feeling well. I had cramps like I was going to puke. Yeah, that time of the month again, so I decided to sleep in. My aunt must have fed my dog and let him out into the fenced-in yard because I didn't hear a peep from him until I woke up around 10.30 to 11. My aunt was already gone to work and I felt awful about not taking my dog on a walk. He's still very young and very energetic. When he doesn't get his walk, he gets so sad and just kind of mopes around all day, so I decided, since it was a nice enough day that the road wouldn't be too hot on his paws, that I'd take him anyway. I got dressed and got everything ready, grabbed my keys, brought him to the door all harnessed up and ready, opened the door, and hanging across from the door on our porch is a hook that normally my aunt puts these hanging flower vases on early in spring, Instead of a flower vase, though, there was a black backpack. It was just a normal black hiker's backpack that had a strap over the top to hold a sleeping bag and a couple of compartments on the side to hold a water bottle, plus if you wanted to add any other bags to it. Weird, but my aunt was about to go on vacation and she's a bit of a pack rat. She probably found it on the back of her closet and hung it up to air dry so it wouldn't stink when she took it with her. I completely pushed it from my mind locked the door behind me, and we went on our way. About an hour or so later, we come back. The backpack hasn't moved, obviously. Brush right past it, go inside, and continue my morning. My aunt had a particularly long day at work, and I had to turn the porch light on for her so she could see to come inside. When she got to the porch, she paused for a moment, but I thought nothing of it. My dog is famous for launching at the door when she sees it's one of our vehicles that pulls in, and sometimes you want to take a second so he doesn't slam the door into your face. 
She came in and of course told my dog what a good boy he was and all the baby talk dogs normally get. She glances at me while she's on her way to the kitchen and asks what's up with the backpack. I told her I thought it was hers. We kind of stare at each other for a few moments, processing what had just been said and my aunt is immediately uneasy. She asks if we should call the police. Probably smart, but as you will realize throughout this story, I am not smart. I like to think I'm tough. I've seen some stuff, been through a lot. I don't like to think that there's things that I can't handle, so I told her we don't need to call the cops. It's just a backpack. I go out, and though my hand hovers over it in hesitation for just a moment, I grab it by the middle and tug it off the hook, taking it inside. I shoo off my dog, whose nose is immediately attached to it, and take it to the table where I inspect every single pocket of the entire thing. Empty. Completely empty. The only thing that is even worth noting about this particular backpack was a long white tag on the back of the largest compartment, which in perfect block letter sharpie read the name Dave. I didn't know anyone named Dave, and the few people my aunt knew named that either wouldn't make sense to be them or they weren't in the area. I could tell she was freaked out, and I hate to see her all worked up, so I told her I'd go talk to the neighbors, sure that one of them could come up with an explanation. Now about my house, without giving away landmarks, I live on a hillside where houses are kind of stacked on top of each other. For example, on my road there's our house, a neighbor next to me, a neighbor next to him, a house at the end of the dead end, and then a mirror of houses across the street. This happens for four different streets going up this particular part of land. The first place I go are to my neighbors across the street, Jack and Jill. Jack answers the door, but as soon as he sees me, he assumes I'm there for Jill and calls her, while he goes back to the couch and his beer. Jill and I do our usual pleasantries, and then I ask her about the backpack, showing it to her. She looks it over and shows it to her husband, who remarked that it's weird for it to be a hiker's backpack, because pretty much everyone around us has small children, so no one really does intense hiking anymore. They also didn't know anyone named Dave that it would be attached to. I thanked them anyway and wished them a good night. I didn't expect a different answer, but mostly just to talk to someone about it, I went to my friend Megan's house. I practically jumped out of my skin when a six-foot-two wall of muscle opened the door. I still wasn't used to her husband being around. He'd been back for a few months from deployment now, but Usually, Megan came over to my place where we'd go out and do things together with her baby, a ten-month-old, and her son, three years old. I exchanged pleasantries and asked if I could see Megan, which she happily got her for me. She had a giant smile on her face as she came to the door, ready to hug me, only for her smile to turn into a question as she saw the backpack. Her husband, James, seemed to sense that there was some sort of tension in the air, so he didn't go far. I explained about the backpack and how it had freaked out my aunt a little bit. Megan looked it over, but as expected, no idea of who it could belong to. Just then the baby started crying, so she rushed an apology and I waved it off, giving her a farewell. I told James goodnight and turned to go off from the porch. He touched my arm on the second step down, stopping me. He asked when my aunt was leaving for her vacation and I told him she leaves on the 8th. I didn't think it was strange he knew even if Megan hadn't told him. Everybody knew my aunt and how she'd been planning this vacation for months. He seemed to think for a moment, and then as if a light bulb went off, he suggested he come up on the 9th in the morning, just to make sure everything was alright. I was a little hesitant because I didn't really know James, but I trusted Megan, so if she thought he was good, then he must be good. I accepted and thanked him. He offered to walk me back to my house, but... I laughed it off and told him something cheeky like I think I can handle it or something silly. I felt his eyes on my back the entire way until I got to my house and I happened to glance at him just as I was shutting the door and he was still out on his porch just watching me. I set the backpack on the floor next to where we keep our shoes and I told my aunt no luck with finding the owner. But James was going to be popping in while she was gone to make sure I would still be breathing when she got back. She laughed and we carried on with our night. She leaves as scheduled and the whole day was overall uneventful. I got home from work late, fed my dog, decided to work on schoolwork until it was time for me to go to bed. 
The next morning, I get up around 7, get everything ready and go out the door and almost run right into James who is standing on the bottom of my steps. My dog is giving him the death stare but I rub his head and he instantly relaxes, leaning on me. James asks if everything was fine and I told him nothing weird had happened. It had been quiet and uneventful. He offered to walk the property which seemed unnecessary but he had already started walking off before I could say anything else so I shrugged at my dog and we followed him to the backyard. My dog was a lot more interested in the sticks than anything he might have been looking for so I started playing a little game with him with the sticks until James called out to me from on the other side of the deck. We went to where he was and I glanced into my house through my sliding glass door, more out of impulse than anything. I walked down the little divot in the rocks that lined our deck and pretty much a whole pack worth of cigarette butts were just laying there smoked and then smushed into rocks. Whoever had been there was there for a while. James seemed to have been thinking the same thing I was because after a few moments of looking at each other, he said he should probably come up the next morning too. That night, I was really freaked out, but I tried to play it cool. If someone was watching me, I didn't want to give them the satisfaction of knowing I was scared. I turned up my music and tried to focus on my bio quiz instead of the million what-ifs that were going through my mind. The next morning, James beat me to it. I was debating if I should take Ash on a walk that day or not when he knocked on my door. I unlocked and opened the door for him, reporting that nothing of interest happened the night before. He seemed relieved by the news, which made me feel better. I told him about not being sure if I should be walking Ash by myself anymore, and he offered to go with me. In the back of my mind, I felt a little weird spending so much time with my best friend's husband while she was home with two little kids, but it's not like I was going to steal him, as everyone knows I'm into girls, and I was going through some tough stuff at the moment. James was a little strange, but we got along well enough, plus having a super tall, muscular, military-trained, take-no-nonsense kind of guy around at that point did genuinely make me feel safer. The day went on pretty much the same, 9th, 10th, 11th. James seemed a little off yesterday before he went home. I kept asking him if everything was alright and if he'd just be quiet for a moment, staring off and then look at me and smiling and saying it was nothing. I didn't believe him, but it was obvious he didn't want to talk about it. I was wondering if maybe Megan was giving him guff for spending so much time with me, and I was planning on telling him the next morning that I think whatever was happening was over and I would probably be fine now. It must have been someone trying to scare me, I thought. Early into the night last night, I could tell I wasn't going to be sleeping. I never sleep long much anyway, but sometimes I can go days at a time being tired, but not being able to sleep. James was a million miles away from my mind as I lay in bed, reading my book on my tablet. My dog was curled up next to my legs, sleeping, and suddenly he stopped snoring. He lays perfectly still and silent for maybe two seconds and then lifts his head up and growls. I pet him and tell him it's okay. It was probably going around 11pm or so. If anyone was out there, it was probably Jack or my next door neighbor Jake, whose dogs decided they needed to go pee in the middle of the night, so they were standing out there with a leash, pleading their respective dogs to do their business and get back inside so they can go back to sleep. My dog spooks easily and growls at night, but usually me talking to him and petting him helps him calm down. It wasn't helping this time. In fact, he seemed to be getting more agitated. I could see the whites of his eyes as he looked at me in panic. I was trying to comfort him when there was a loud knock on the front door. I visibly jumped and clutched my chest for a moment to try and calm down my heart which was racing. My dog didn't like the knocking either. His haunches were up and he was out in the living room, pointed like a missile at the door. I put my hand on his back on the way past him to go up to the door. I tried to make my voice steadier than it would have been otherwise and I asked who it was. It was James. He asked if he could talk to me. He sounded a little upset but not mad or anything, just different from how he usually sounded. Now it was 11pm at night and this is a married man who probably should not be coming over to a much younger woman's house, not to mention I am short and not muscular, physically imposing or at all intimidating. As we revisit many times in this post, I am an idiot and I chide myself for being an idiot. 
If this were Megan on my doorstep at this time, upset, I'd let her in in a second. I open the door for him and am immediately hit with a wall of alcohol stench. I didn't even know James drank. I never saw him touch so much as a beer. I asked him if everything was okay, which he kind of shrugged off and evaded answering. I was immediately regretting opening the door and my alarm bells were immediately going off. This was nothing like if Megan came over upset. This was not okay. I needed him to leave. I suck down a curse word as he enters the room and sits down on the couch. I put up my hands so that my dog won't move and my dog looks at my movement but his eyes immediately go back to James. He's not growling, he's not snarling, he's not moving, he's just staring, low to the ground, ready for anything to happen. I turn to face James not wanting to turn my back on him and leave the door open enough so I could slip out and shut it behind me. I make sure there's nothing between me and freedom but he just sits there, he's not even looking at me. He has that far away distant look that he had had before he left earlier. I was about to say his name when he just starts talking really fast, ranting almost. It was so much information coming at me so fast it was hard to process it for a moment. He was telling me that I was smart because I didn't have kids at a young age. That girls are always way too eager to have kids these days. He stood up and squared off as if he were going to try and fight me right there, but he just looked at me and told me how that Megan had ruined his life because she was so stupid and couldn't figure out how to take birth control every day. He told me how he only let her have the first kid because he was 100% sure that he would not survive his first tour. Then when he did survive, he immediately signed up to go back. He came home for a while. It took longer than he thought it for them to get him back over there and she got pregnant again. He'd let her keep that one because he knew he'd die this time. When he went back over there, he was a lot more reckless. He did a lot more horrible things. Made people a lot more angry. Things that happen in war that I don't even want to think about. He stops his ranting and it's as if he just realized I was the one he was talking to. He looked really lost and confused for a moment. I didn't know what to say, but the back of my head was saying maybe this was a PTSD thing and he needed to get some help. Honestly, my number one priority was going to check on Megan and the babies. I know he'd never hurt them intentionally. I knew he wouldn't hurt me, but PTSD can mess people up big time. Without moving, I tried to comfort him. I told him it would all work out. It's perfectly normal to feel overwhelmed as a dad, especially if you miss the first part of your children's lives. He'd get there. We'd help him. He watched me the entire time I spoke to him and almost seemed like he was back to normal. I half expected him to just walk out the door, go home, and us never speak of this again. Just a new father facing his new responsibilities. He just exhaled really long as he smiled, watching me for a few moments. Then he sat back on the couch. In the moment between standing and sitting, it was like he turned into a completely different person. I can't even describe his face, it was completely emotionless. He didn't even look bored, just nothing, and his voice was the same way. It was almost like in one of those old movies where a guy is obviously voicing the robot, except there was nothing funny about this. It was terrifying. The only thing that even resembled the James I knew was the sparkle in his eyes. He has really dark blue eyes that are normally closed off and give nothing away. But occasionally, when we got to laughing on our walks or just when he first saw me in the morning, there was a certain light that would just come into his eyes that I never really wanted to put too much thought to. He sat there for a moment and with his robot monotone voice, he said the words that I don't think I'll ever forget. It's so much more fun to watch people when they don't know you're watching them. This game of cat and mouse I've been playing with you has been the best I've felt since coming back stateside. In movies, this is the part when you get mad at the girl character for not running, not fighting, nothing. But I couldn't. It was like I was in concrete. I couldn't speak, I couldn't move. I felt like I couldn't even breathe. It seemed like it took only a second for him to be standing in front of me. I felt his fingers trace over my cheek and start to pull my head up from my chin so I'd look at him or so he could kiss me or whatever was going on in his mind at that moment. I wouldn't look at him. I wouldn't even cry. 
My eyes were as frozen as the rest of me. I felt his breath on my lips and then all of a sudden his hands were off me. I couldn't move, but my dog could, and he either jumped on him or bit him. His cry of pain was enough to wake me up from whatever trance I was under. I ran from the house as fast as I could. I think I felt his hand grab at mine as I was running out the door, but I can't be sure if that was real or if that's just something that showed up in my brain afterward. I admit that in that moment I was not a good friend. I didn't even think about going to Megan's house and playing hero. The fact her babies could be dying didn't even cross my mind. I climbed onto Jack's porch and started hammering on the door as loud as I could, screaming for them to help me. Jack is very fat and lazy and also a high-functioning alcoholic, but when he opened the door, it only took a second of seeing the fear in my eyes for him to grab me by the shoulder and practically throw me into Jill who was standing behind him. He roared for Jill to call 911. This is when I made my second selfish request of these wonderful people. I was literally on the floor, hugging myself, sobbing. I was having trouble breathing, I was sobbing so hard. I was making Jill cry, just watching me. I, literally on my knees, begged this man who I had only been to a few block parties with and our dogs had been on maybe three playdates together, to go save my baby because James would hurt him. Jack didn't even hesitate. As soon as he heard James' name, a fire lit up in this man's eyes like I'd never seen before, and he tore into his living room and grabbed one of his guns. Jill was full out, sobbing by this time, and she couldn't tell the operator what was going on. She didn't know. She just kept saying her address over and over again, begging them for help. I heard my front door open, and it's like all sorrow in me dried immediately. I wasn't crying. I wasn't having trouble breathing. I stood up and looked out the door. James was on my porch, his hands up scowling down at Jack as if though he was ruining his night. It would have been smart to stay in the house at this point and wait for the police, but I am not smart, so I rushed outside. Jill clawed at me desperately, begging me not to leave her, but I brushed her off. I wasn't scared at all. I ran out and scanned around the open doorway in the porch. I happened to meet James's eyes and he smiled at me. It was as if he was actually happy to see me. There was blood all over him, but I didn't care about him anymore. That's when I saw the black mass at the bottom of my step. You could see the white stripe around his neck completely soaked with blood. By now, pretty much every neighbor on our street was outside their house asking what happened. Everyone except for Megan and her babies. I couldn't think about what that meant. I had to get to my baby. I jumped off the porch and started running towards the black mass. Jack says he was screaming at me to stop and James turned to walk down the stairs towards me, but I didn't hear or acknowledge any of this. I dropped to my knees and hugged my dog, practically screaming with grief. It was some time when I dropped to my knees, but before James could get to me, three squad cars came tearing into our yards and driveways. Guns were pulled. No one knew what was happening since Jill hadn't been able to relay any information over the phone. James identified himself as a Marine and told them that he wanted Jack arrested for threatening him. Jack wanted James arrested for doing whatever he was doing to me and I couldn't hear any of them. My dog looked up at me with the most intense eyes, licked a tear off my face and thumped his tail twice before he laid back down, whining. I looked up as an arm was put on my shoulder. It was my next door neighbor Jake. Jake had gotten his dog as a puppy the same time I got mine and we were both avid animal lovers. He took our dogs to puppy kindergarten together. They graduated puppy school together. We even took a couple of shifts volunteering at the same animal shelter that I got my dog from. I knew I could trust this man with my dog. His wife Helen was standing a distance behind him, looking like she was ready to break every one of James's fingers if he stepped off the last step onto the ground, which would have made him close enough to touch my hair. Jake had to repeat himself twice before I understood and let go of my dog. He picked up my dog immediately and rushed him to his car. Helen, rushing over and pulling me away from James, who had been watching me through the entire exchange. When I look back at him, his hand was even extended out and lifted with me, as if he expected me to take it and say this was all a misunderstanding. Jake tore past the cop cars to take my dog to the emergency vet clinic. 
James and Jack were put into handcuffs in the back of patrol cars in my front yard with Helen behind me, rubbing my shoulder and Jill holding my hand crying. Covered in the mix of dogs and James' blood, I directed one group over to James's house where Megan and the babies were still nowhere to be seen and I told them what happened. I tried to be as detailed as possible but I was pretty hard into shock, so even this version is more detailed than the one I posted a few hours ago in another thread. Everyone got a ride to the station, but Jack was released soon after and is actually being named a hero for going above and beyond to defend his neighbor. A cop that knows my aunt very well took pity on me and took me to the emergency vet clinic where I sat in the waiting room with Jake and cried for I don't even know how long. He stayed with me the entire time and held my hand through it. The vet working my dog came out and said that two of his legs had been broken. All of the ribs on one side of him were damaged in some way and it was very touch and go for a while because of internal bleeding. He said that he was responding well to medications and he was resting comfortably at the moment. They let me go in and see him and I sat with him for those early hours of the morning until about 10 a.m. Jake had to leave but he said to call him when I was ready to go home. I would have probably stayed longer but the doctor said they all knew my dog was a hero and they'd take good care of him if I wanted to go home and wash up. I was already a mess from crying non-stop for hours and not having slept at all yet but with the now dried on blood all over my clothes and skin, I probably look like a zombie. I went back home and stumbled upon Jake, Helen, and Jill trying with every bit of know-how they could to scrub all the blood off the walls, floors, and ceiling before I got home. I thanked them and told them I needed to be alone for a bit. They agreed to leave, but only after asking if I was sure about a hundred times. I didn't even take my clothes off. I just laid down in the bottom of the bathtub with the shower running and tried to make sense of what just happened to me. When I finally did get undressed and scrubbed all the blood and dirt off from me, I got changed into clean clothes so I could go back to the vet clinic as soon as possible, sat at the kitchen table and called my aunt. There are still some mysteries that, unless James tells them, they'll never know. They found a digital camera in his house and the entire reel was just pictures of me from different windows in my house just doing mundane things. Apparently the pictures were dated all the way back to a few days after he got back from deployment. We don't know what set him off that night. We don't know what his intentions were to do to me. I'm very small compared to him and even with my dog in the room, he could have easily overpowered me at any time. He could have even just shut the door. He could have done so many things to trap me in there with him, to hurt me, but it was like he just let me escape. And that's the one thing that bothers the cops, and honestly Jack, is we just weren't sure what his intentions were. I don't know if he thinks I'm lying or not, I know the cops think so. That moment when James was standing on the bottom step, his hand reached out to me and Helen was holding me to her a few feet away. The cops were rushing to get him when they pulled him off the step. To put his hands behind his back, he pushed forward and shoved his face against my face and whispered into my ear. They pulled him off immediately and dragged him into the car. He didn't even fight them. He just kept looking back at me as long as he could. Of course, one of the cops immediately asked what he had said to me and what it meant. I honestly have no idea. I don't even know if I heard him right and he refused to say a single word since they arrested him. I think he said, You're my lily. But that doesn't make any sense. He never once called me that in reference or anything, and he's never called his wife that, and she doesn't recall Lily's or anyone named Lily being an influential part of his life. Now, a report on the health status as of 20 hours after I let James into my house. Megan has a cracked jaw, a broken nose, two black eyes, a concussion, and apparently she had been unconscious when he left to come to my house. The three-year-old had to try to protect his mom and got kicked pretty bad. He's in the hospital right now where his mom says that the doctors are a little worried about his ribs, but he seems to be okay. He's just very confused, as they both are. The baby was dropped during the attack and apparently got a bump to the head. Doctors are keeping an eye on it, but they think she's going to be okay. Megan told the police that before last night, James never so much as raised his voice at her. His bad mood seemed to come out of nowhere. She was just asking him where he'd been, if I was alright, etc., and it seemed to set him off. 
The worst of the blows were to the side of her head because she was holding the baby when he started hitting her and she crouched down to protect the baby. My dog is still not home, but they called a few hours ago and said they tested him off the ventilator and he's now breathing on his own. I still haven't slept and I don't know when I ever will again. The worst part of all of this is I don't think I can even emotionally handle being friends with Megan anymore. I know she needs her friends now more than ever and I'm her best friend, but I just can't look at her. I don't blame her for bringing James into my life because it wasn't her fault, but I do blame her for not noticing something was wrong sooner. I blame her for never questioning why he was never home at night. Never questioning why whenever he went out into the dark he brought his camera with him. There's just so much I'm not okay with right now, and the biggest thing is that he didn't end anyone's life, but he hurt his wife, assaulted his child, stalked me, and tried to destroy my dog. He's not going away forever. He could get out at any time. I don't even know if all of the charges they do have against him will stick. I don't know how long I have before he's free again, and every time I look at her, that's all I can think of. The only other thing that really bothers me, something that I hate him for and I hate the cop who brought it to everyone else's attention instead of just letting it swirl in my head where it should have stayed, I was the target. I was the one he was after and I'm the only one in this situation who did not get injured by him in any way. I don't know what he would have done to me if my dog hadn't intervened. I don't know what his plan was, but my dog reacted because I was terrified. James didn't make a move to hurt me. He didn't make a move to stop me from leaving. When he finally got his hands on me and had the chance to hurt me, all he did was try to force me to look at him and put his face really close to my face, which honestly felt like he was trying to kiss me. I don't even know why I hate that fact so much, but sitting here all alone at night with the next room over still splattered with blood, the fact that I don't even have so much as a scratch on me is what is eating me alive. There's no place to even begin this story other than jumping straight into it. I was entering freshman year and from what I understand this year is super special for the simple fact that you finally have new beginnings. I figured I've moved past from middle school and I would become my own person and make new friends. Now, it was quite hard to make new friends because we all live in a very small town in the middle of nowhere, and our high school has 400 students, maybe. It's a very small school system. It's a place where everyone knows everyone, so it makes it hard to find new people to talk to if their initial impression of you is a bad one. I was hoping to be friends with some older kids since my older brother and his friends were then entering their junior year. Enough story prior to the main one, and now I'd like to get to the main story. I wanted friends, as mentioned before, but before this I really needed to know where I was going inside my school. My schedule was up to my nose 90% of the day on my first few days and I got through my first few classes on day one. My second period class with health class for the first semester. In this class there were a few people from every grade level but only one senior. I found this odd but I never questioned it because I didn't understand the credit system quite yet. He introduced himself to me as Brian. I introduced myself, of course, and we left it at that. He was attractive, and I didn't know his age until later in the year, so he deemed himself as a love interest to me. The class was normal, and so were the others, but then I hit fifth period, and Brian was in this class with me as well. It was world history, and the teacher of that class was very close with me, and we are still close to this day. He was a natural father figure to me. Anyways, Brian and I had the class together, but I also had the same class with my present-day acquaintance, Cameron. Cameron was the world's biggest nerd, and he's quite narcissistic, but he's also hilarious, and he too was a person I was interested in at the time, because I could relate to him a lot, but I realized he was just a friend. Brian and I talked a little bit about our assignments, and then we continued on with our days. No other classes emerged from this point with Brian. The second day began, and... He approached me in health by stating my name as if it were a question. He talked my ear off in that class, and he actually sat next to me that day. I thought nothing of it because I liked the way he looked, and he now wanted to talk to me. I felt special, to say the least. 
Nothing out of the ordinary, and he waved at me in the halls and such. I felt like I was finally making friends. The next class with him came before I knew it, and we had normal conversations, including small arguments me and the two boys had. It was day three. This is when things began to get very, very weird. After my first period class, I found Brian at my locker. How he knew that was my locker, I wasn't sure, but I assumed he knew I was somewhere down this hallway, and he maybe glanced and saw me there once or twice. I thought nothing of it and said hello and grabbed my stuff. He walked to my second period health with me, and once again I thought nothing of it. Class was normal, but I had an odd feeling in my stomach and my heartbeat was elevated. I was nervous. Brian knew my full name, which is nothing odd, but he also knew things that I never told him. He knew my brother too well, and he also knew my old and new friends. He knew my past relationship and how it ended. He knew my favorite color and my hobbies, including the sports I played. Now all of this sounds quite normal, and the information isn't weird to know about someone, but it's weird when you've never had the conversation with them about any of it. It made my stomach drop, so I got aggressive, and asked him how he knew those things, and he brushed it off and told me that he just did his research, and we never spoke of it again. I asked Cameron what it could mean, and Cameron assumed it was because Brian liked me. I guess he was right, then also thought nothing of it. Day three, though, wasn't the worst day. On that day, I watched him get on my bus, and he never rode my bus before. He ignored me and sat in a seat one and to the right of me. We didn't talk at all through the ride, and when I got home, I got a request from him on Facebook. I accepted, and he sent me a message, and it was all normal conversation. I got to school the next day, and the first words he said were, Now I know where you live. At this point, it's been four days into the school year, and this man, Brian, knew more about me than I intended him to know the first week. On day four, though, he memorized my schedule by heart. I asked him how he knew that, and he said he saw my schedule in my binder and looked to see if we had other classes together, not the first day. Brian, from this day on, walked me from class to class and always bothered me. He was obsessing, and I was terrified. He always would whisper odd things to me in health class and I would have to ignore him to get him to stop. This went on for months and it progressively got worse. One day Brian and Cameron got into a fight about something I said and Cameron told Brian that I was scared of him and I could see this look in Brian's eyes that makes me grow weak any time I think about it. Brian asked if it was true and I said nothing then I remember Brian looked at Cameron and told him that I was his as if I was an object that they were fighting over, and chills went through my spine from that statement, but I did nothing. From that day forward, he began to say that I was his. Luckily, as mentioned before, my brother was in high school with me, and his friends treated me like I was their little sister. I had helped through the situation before it grew too late. My friend Anna was there and helped me through the entire thing. When I finally opened up to her, she grew furious because she felt I didn't deserve to have this creepy guy attached to me. We went straight to the principal about it. The principal told me that since this has gone on so long, it was partially my fault. I didn't speak up soon enough and I never told him to stop, so how was he supposed to know? The principal also in turn said this wasn't the first time it's happened and that he should have known better. After talking to the principal, I got sent to class and I wanted to cry. I actually felt like it was all my fault. The next day in health class, Mr. Sandin stopped me and asked me about what was going on, and he told me he would rearrange the classroom for my sake. I told him what had happened vaguely and asked him to please do so. Mr. Sandin was sympathetic to my situation, but very angry with Brian for treating me the way he did. Brian, after class, asked me what was going on, and I said nothing. I just walked to my next class. Then world history came along and Mr. Brown knew what was going on already and addressed me and asked if I was okay. He didn't move the seats though, so I was still stuck next to Brian, but Cameron was there luckily. Cameron knew I was uncomfortable around Brian since day two, so he helped me through it. The next day, the principal called me to the office as soon as I arrived into the school, and Anna was waiting there and she apologized, but she said she needed this to end for my sake. 
I had to face Brian, and I was a crying mess in the principal's office, and he was yelling towards me, not necessarily at me, and was telling me to tell Brian I didn't want to talk to him anymore. Through my tears, I muttered it out, and the principal dismissed me. As soon as I closed the door behind me, I heard yelling back and forth between the two, and I broke down. I spent the rest of my day hidden in my hood in fear of the next day. Days and days after that, Brian continued to pester me and get inside my head. He was everywhere, and he even went to begin touching me physically like grabbing my arm to stop me or touching my shoulders. Once he blocked me from going to my biology class by trying to get me to hug him and all I remember is getting suddenly angry, and I pushed him a little too hard, and I walked forward and disappeared into my class. He gave up and began dating one of my friends, and then one day he just disappeared. My Facebook got hacked and sent a dumb video out to everyone, and I went through and sent everyone a message saying sorry and telling them what happened. One of those people was Brian. I thought I had blocked him, but I guess I was wrong. I got a notification from him, and I opened it reluctantly. He said that I deserved it, and that I also in turn deserved every negative thing I got in my life, and he began to say bad things on my name and my school's name. He said that I never changed, and I was still cold-hearted, and I had nothing to say in return. I never said sorry, and that was the last I've heard of him. Freshman year is a special year for everyone. It just depends on who you are, of course. I hope nothing like this happens to anyone. I spared some details to keep this story from getting too terribly long, but these were major points. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to answer, but I'm praying that I'll never have to meet this man again. This happened when my friend and I were 15 years old. We both lived super close to each other, so I'd often go to her place after school to do homework and hang out. Her house had a park that pretty much backs up to it and a side entrance to the park that is literally right next to her house. It's typically only used by people in the neighborhood, but you are immediately in the thickest part of the woods when you enter from that entrance. So it was a Friday and we really didn't have any homework for the weekend. Her mom had dropped us off at the house and left to do errands, so we decided to go on a walk with her dog. We live in a very good neighborhood with low crime and we were very familiar and comfortable with the park. Plus, there being two of us with a dog during the day, we weren't all that worried. So we change out of our school uniforms, get some hiking shoes on, and make our way to the park entrance. We start our walk, and the day is a perfect day for being outside. We instantly fall into comfortable conversation as we head to our favorite part of the woods. So there's a couple of miles of winding paved trail until we run into the first split. If you go left, it will lead you to the main park area with swings, restrooms, picnic area, and all of that. If you go right, it leads to a bridge that will take you to another trail option. We went right to head over the bridge since the trail we wanted was that way. This is where things got weird. We began making our way over the bridge and see a runner heading our direction. We both moved to the side to let him pass and I just got a really bad feeling. You know the one, hair standing up on ends heart speeding up, and just a true sense of alarm by this person. He passed us and stared at us over his shoulder a while, but I mostly decided I was being overly paranoid or he was staring at the dog because who doesn't like looking at a cute dog? After all, he seemed pretty average and non-threatening in general. Still, I tucked it in the back of my mind just to stay a little more aware of our surroundings. So we continue on our walk, which leads to another two trail options. Left continues as a paved area and right as a dirt trail that is overgrown in spots. We took the right because it was deeper into the woods and where our hangout spot was. So our spot is completely off the dirt trail and we have to walk across a log over a small part of the creek to get to it. So not many people know about this area which is why we liked it. Most people don't even take the dirt trail unless they are bird watching or taking nature photos. We get to our spot and we hang out just chatting about life. We both didn't have the best home life, crazy mothers putting it mildly, so it was nice to be able to chat with each other about stuff in privacy. So maybe ten minutes after we made it to this spot, we heard a branch snap at a distance from us. 
From where we were, we could see that someone was on the dirt trail, but whoever it was wouldn't have an easy view of us. We looked over, and my heart just drops. I can just make out the runner from the bridge to the trees. He had on bright red shorts, so it was easy to tell it was him. Immediately, we both knew that something was not right. This isn't a trail someone out on a run would take ever, and he obviously turned around on his run to head back in our direction, and he had originally come from the paved trail that we didn't take earlier, so alarm bells were ringing. He walks past our spot and quietly continues down the dirt trail, no longer running like he's trying to be quiet. We are at a decent distance, and thankfully... He was keeping his gaze forward or he may have seen us. My friend and I are silently watching and when he is out of view she turns to me and says, We need to go now. And I say, Yeah, something's not right about that guy. My friend just nods yes. So she lets her dog off her leash. She is very good at following and she would be able to move faster without the lead and so would we. I do have to mention that this dog will not be helpful if the situation escalates because she failed at being a service dog because she was overly friendly to strangers, i.e. she couldn't stay focused on her tasks. So very obedient, but everyone is a friend. So no helping coming from her, and he hadn't even been deterred from seeing her to begin with. She was just a very smaller yellow lab. We take off at this point, trying to be quiet and fast because we will have to cross over the dirt trail that he was on, and we don't want him coming back and seeing us. My friend falls, scrambling across the log into the creek. I slip at the end, so both of us have very waterlogged shoes, and we panic because of the noise. So we just take off, knowing that we already made a ton of noise anyway. We didn't run back to the paved area because we were too deep into the woods at this point and a straight shot was our best bet. We very quietly hear noise from behind us and she yells to me that he's following us. I am not a runner but adrenaline saved the day because I could have ran a marathon with how scared I was. So we are crashing through the bushes and not following any sort of trail at this point but heading in the direction we needed to go to get out of the woods and closer to our house. We had to be running for at least 15 minutes and most of the time my friend is yelling directions to me from behind because she can still see the guy. I'm clumsy and I knew if I looked back that I'd be the idiot to trip like in the movies. At some point we either lost him or he gave up but we finally broke through the woods into the field because the woods and the houses in her neighborhood. So we jog close to the fences, heading to our house, scanning the edge of the woods and trying to get oxygen back into our lungs. We never saw anything once we made it out of the woods, but we didn't feel safe until we got inside her house. We were a mess. She soaked up to her thighs and I'm soaked up to my calves. At one point, I wrap my hands around the branches coated with thorns so my hands are bleeding. She has some rips in her pants and shirt and her dog was perfectly fine because she didn't fall into the creek like an idiot and avoided all the thorns. We immediately start talking and she said she had the same creepy feeling about the guy too but didn't say anything at the time either. She said she noticed that he had given her dog kind of a dirty look which is what made her feel uncomfortable. She had also caught a few glimpses of his face while we were running from him and she said he looked absolutely livid. Her mom got home and we told her what happened. Now her mom is not someone I'm a fan of. She merely tells us he was probably an off-duty cop coming to check on us to make sure we were okay since we were two young girls alone in the woods. Neither of us bought her explanation but she managed to make us feel like idiots. I never mentioned anything to my mom because she would have just blamed us for going on a walk by ourselves so nothing came of it. That was also the last time we went into the woods, just the two of us. We only ever went with a group of friends or her older brother, but we never saw him again. As an adult, I realized how truly messed up the situation was. The guy had to have been about six foot two and in his forties. I was five one and my friend was five three. We both looked even younger than fifteen because I still had people at restaurants automatically giving me a child's menu when we went out to eat so there wasn't any real excuse for a grown man to follow two young females into a secluded part of the woods when we were obviously scared of him. So it's been over a decade now, and we now live in the same neighborhood and frequent the park. 
The dirt trail is now paved and a lot of the trees have been cleared away. I still to this day can't go to this park without looking for that guy though or keeping a constant lookout for someone to start following me. So I truly hope I never ever meet this creep again, even though so much time has passed. So this happened a few months ago when I was taking Hapkido class in Korea. It was a small class of five to eight people at the time. There's three classes that happen every day in three consecutive hours. I take the first class when I have time from work or the later class when I can't. I usually try to make it as much as possible. Whenever I take the first class I would finish up and get ready to leave and I would notice that the second class always had one guy. He is a much older Korean man and looks somewhere to be in his 40s. If you've ever seen a guy in an anime who's the creepy old guy with glasses, that's basically what he looks like. He only wears half the uniform and trains with the master privately. I assumed he was a co-trainer, but he may have been a close friend because his class level wasn't that far ahead of me. He speaks pretty decent English and translates sometimes for the master. I also never interact with him unless he tries to have a short conversation between classes. But one day he asked me for my number. I asked for what? And he says it's for updates in the class. The way he was acting was really weird when he was asking me. He looked at me wide-eyed and really nervous and even breathed kind of loud, like he was hiding something. I also noticed how he made sure to only ask me when we weren't around the master. Suspicious, I gave him a fake number. He looks like he got a huge sigh of relief as I gave it to him. Then, at the corner of my eye, I catch him doing his best attempt of very discreetly bending his phone upwards at me, and I hear a camera shudder. I look back and he's doing his wide-eyed, nervous look again with the really heavy breathing. Before I can say anything, the master calls me over to train. As I'm stretching, I can see him sitting on the bench in the back of the class right next to my bags, and I can see him occasionally doing his nondiscreet phone bending in my direction again. Even though I can't hear his phone this time, I can pretty much assume what he's doing. I couldn't explain this to the master because he doesn't speak English very well, and my other classmates don't speak Korean. He teaches using a lot of charades and word repetition in case you're wondering. But anyways, after class... He tells me to come in tomorrow to the later class. This is strange because I've been going for a while and he's never done this before. Maybe it was part of his schedule availability, so I agreed. The next day I show up to the designated time and I find the guy who took my picture sitting there waiting with the master having a conversation. I thought maybe he's just finishing up the second class he is usually in and getting ready to leave. Instead, the master calls me over and points to the other guy with a big smile and says, new training partner. I look over at the man and he's smiling really creepy about this, so I reluctantly agreed. It was just the three of us that day, by the way. We start our class with the usual stretching and practice with our partners. When it was time for me to practice new moves on my partner, he started to do his creepy look again and started to lick his lips when I was reaching out to grab him. After the class, the master told me to come every day at that exact class because this guy wanted to be my partner. I just nervously told him that I had work to do, and the guy looked really hurt about it. After I left, I never went back. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit are Let's Read Official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data located on both Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.